Hi, I'm Dustin Abbott, and I'm here today to give you a review of an interesting lens in that it is inexpensive, but also it has the ability to produce really quite dynamic images. And that is the Pergear 14 millimeter F2.8 Mark II lens. Now, obviously, since we're talking about a Mark II, there was a original or Mark I lens, and Pergear pretty quickly has refreshed that lens, addressing what were some of the primary criticisms of it. And so we have a lens that is smaller in size, obviously always important. It has reduced flare, though as we're going to see, not totally reduced as of yet. It has a closer focusing distance at 21 centimeters versus 43 centimeters for the original lens. And there is a better implementation of the filter ring for the lens. And so some pretty significant updates here. And as we're going to find, in many ways, this is actually a very high performing lens, despite its low price tag of just 299 US dollars. So a lens that you probably might be interested in if you're looking for an inexpensive wide angle option, and one that actually even works for doing astro and interiors as we're going to see. So is this a lens that you should consider? We'll discover that and explore it all right after a word from our sponsor. Today's episode is brought to you by Into the AM, a clothing brand from Southern California that wants to outfit your passion, whatever it might be. Their everyday comfortable fabrics and designs are great whether you are working from home, working out, or even just chilling out. I love the fit and fabric on their everyday t-shirts, and you can choose more funky styles created in collaboration with local artists like this killer Fractured King hoodie. Use the code DUSTIN10 or follow the link in the description to get 10% off site-wide, including their monthly t-shirt club. Visit intotheam.com forward slash DUSTIN10 for more information. So as noted, this lens is reduced in size. It is quite compact for a wide angle, wide aperture lens, a prime lens. It is 65 millimeters in diameter and it is 80 millimeters in length. So that translates to 2.56 inches by 3.15 inches. And it weighs in at a fairly hefty 500 grams or 17.6 ounces, despite it being so compact. The reason for that is that this is a quite a well-built lens. Everything here is all in metal. Everything feels quite nice. The handling of the lens feels really quite good. And so as a byproduct, you have a lens that is palm size, but has some heft to it that in many ways reminds me of a Zeiss type lens because of a lot of density there and the overall build. Now this is a manual everything lens. We have a manual aperture ring, a manual focus ring. We have no electronics and more on that in just a moment. When it comes to the actual function of these, the manual focus ring has about 110 degree of rotation. It actually moves really beautifully. It has very nice damping. I love the weight of it. Very smooth, no friction points, nothing that feels gritty about it. The aperture ring also moves nicely. It has half stop detents from f2.8 to f5.6 for a little bit more precision. After that point, you only have full, full stop detents from f5.6 to f8 on to f22. I will note one issue here and that is that my on my copy this is not perfectly calibrated in that you can go a little bit to the left of f2.8 and you can go considerably to the right of f20 f22 so there isn't a perfect alignment between what is printed on the aperture ring and where the actual stops or detents are on that so that's maybe one evidence that i found of this being more of a budget lens now one of the things that they addressed here is that rather than the previous design of the lens, which flared out significantly at the front of the lens. We have a lens design here that for a wide angle lens like this, it actually stays quite constant in terms of the diameter. So we do still have a minor fixed lens hood here. We have a lens cap that goes over the top of that. It fits on through suction and just a little bit of friction and it fits in there nicely. There's no possibility of this shaking loose. And so that is a nice fit there. But we also have a novel approach to the ability to to filter the lens. Often lenses with the bulbous front element like this lens, you can't use traditional screw in filters. But what they've done is they've provided you another very nicely made metal piece that uh, bayonets on almost like a lens hood in many cases. You bayonet that into place, it fits on nice and securely. And what it does do is it now provides you with 82 millimeter front filter threads and so you can filter the lens. 
Now I did find that with just this in place, there is no additional vignette, as you can see in this comparison. However, if you are using a, a filter, an ND type filter, where you're going to do a longer exposure, you will see increased vignette, mostly because, not because of a mechanical block, but because this lens does have some fairly high natural vignette, and that magnifies the longer that the exposure is. The more you limit the light, the more that disparity seems to shine out. And so anyway, I do think that this is a really nice filtering solution. And if I had one suggestion, because it works so well, I would say maybe give us an 82 millimeter pinch cap as well, because I suspect many people wouldn't mind leaving this all together like this all the time, because the lens is still quite compact, even with that filter holder in place. As it stands, you can't really use this because it has no ability to, fi to fit in there uh, via suction any longer. And so you're left with that front element exposed unless you remove the filter holder. There are 10 aperture blades inside, and so that creates a unique 10 bladed sun star under the right conditions. As noted previously, the minimum focus distance has dramatically reduced. However, the magnification level is still really low. I'm going to estimate it at somewhere about 0.07 or 0.08 times. It is really still quite low. You're not going to confuse this with a macro type lens at all. Now, when it comes to the fact that there are no electronics, that means there's no, there's also no weather sealing here and nothing to communicate information to the camera itself. So in terms of real world handling, what does that mean? Well, it means that certain lens specific information is not going to be transmitted to the camera. So for example, in your EXIF data, which you know is marked on your photos, it's not going to tell you what the lens was or the focal length or the aperture value because all of those things are lens specific. What you will have is the information about the ISO and the shutter speed because those come from the camera and not from the lens itself. When it comes to actually using this lens, as far as the handling goes, with a wide a wide angle lens like this, the most of the time, unless you are focusing at something very close, focusing is really couldn't be simpler. I found that on at least my copy that infinity is calibrated right to where the hard stop is. And so frankly, you can either go all the way to there or stop a little bit short of that. And if you're stopped down to F4, F5.6, F8, everything is gonna be in focus. You really just have to set focus and forget about it. In fact, I didn't have one misfocus shot when I look back through all of my shots from my trip, for example, and the truth of the matter is that in most situations, I wasn't even really focusing because I just set focus and then I just took photos with it. Now, if you need to focus closer, you can have focus overlays like peaking. Uh, you can also just magnify the image in the viewfinder for the various mounts. This lens comes, I tested in Sony E-mount, but it also comes in Leica L, comes in Canon RF, Nikon Z or Z mount. And so a lot of different full frame mirrorless cameras, but all of those share the ability to have focus aid. So focus, not hard at all. What I did find, however, is that because this lens doesn't have electronics and it also has a lot of vignette, sometimes metering wasn't perfect. And so I had to make some adjustments either in camera or in post to get the metering results that I wanted. So it isn't as simple as using a typical autofocus type lens, but at the same time, it's not a whole lot more difficult. So let's talk about the image quality for a moment. At the moment, there is not a correction profile available for this lens, but as we're going to see, it has low distortion, and when you stop down, the vignette isn't bad, and so you're able to get good video even without correction profile. And obviously, as we're going to see, it's pretty easy to correct for some of these other things in post. Let's dive in and let's take a look. Let's start by pointing out the fact that a 14 millimeter lens really does give you a really unique opportunity to just create different types of images. So in the shot, I was shooting through this obviously cabana bed uh, near the Caribbean Sea there. And you can see that even though I was kind of right on top of it, it gives a really unique kind of environmental feel. It kind of makes you feel like you're there in the image and it allows you just to produce some really dynamic images, which is what I think makes this type of focal length really intriguing, particularly at this kind of price point. So for the more technical side of things, we can see that first of all, for a 14 millimeter lens, distortion is actually really, really well controlled. It's very low in terms of the native amount of distortion that's there. There is some vignette that is a little bit concentrated in the corners, as you can see here, but everything corrects fairly easily. 
Now, there is no correction profile yet available, but I manually corrected by just dialing in a plus three to correct the distortion. You can see it's nice and linear, no issues there for correction. I dialed in a plus 76, which is nearly three stops to get rid of the corners. This is actually a shadow issue that was on this particular shot, so it's actually not a typical lens vignette. You can see from the other corners, however, that that clears things up pretty well. You can also see from this video clip that although there is no correction in camera, that the low amount of distortion, and then also if you stop down to around f5.6 where this video is shot, you'll find that vignette is not a significant issue either. And so footage just looks really clean. That low distortion also makes this an interesting interior lens on a budget. Obviously it gives you a nice really wide perspective so you can put a lot in a room. But you can see looking at the various lines here, nothing has been corrected. You can see that the lines all look quite good. So obviously that is really, really advantageous. Another shot outdoors here, again, no correction. So you can see with a, you know, a very horizontal line going through the front of the image, there's no bulges there. And along the side, the various buildings, everything still looks nice and clean. Now, when it comes to longitudinal chromatic aberrations, you have a very wide focal length, not a huge maximum aperture, and also a, still a fairly low maximum magnification. So that means when it comes to fringing, you're not gonna have a whole lot of opportunities to see fringing in images. And so as a byproduct, I don't think that's a real world issue at all. Far more common with a wide angle light lens like this would be the lateral type of chromatic aberrations that you see near the edge of the frame. But as we can see here in these you know, high transition areas, there's just really not a lot of fringing to see. So not a problem there. Now in this case, I did my review on a 61 megapixel Sony A7R Mark V. That's currently the highest resolution level for a full frame 35 millimeter sensor right now. So in some ways it would seem almost unfair to put a $300 wide angle lens on a high resolution body like that. But as we can see here, even at f2.8 in the center of the frame, the center of the frame looks fantastic. If we move off towards the middle of the frame here, this mid frame, it's looking really good on this left side and right up into the corners, it looks quite good. If we pop down here and look at this side, it looks good. Now on this side, I feel like there's just a little bit more of a jittery quality. So maybe not a perfect centering, but we can see even down into the corner, it still looks quite good. So that leads us to a second real value for a lens like this, and that is for shooting in night. And so you can see at 100% magnification, there's just great detail everywhere that we look here, even though it's a nighttime scene. And as we're going, we talked about already, it's a very easy lens to focus or really to just kind of leave focused. And so you can shoot at night and just know that everything is going to be in focus. You're going to have nice detail, even at f2.8. Now, if we stop down from f2.8 to f4 on the right side, we can see that contrast does improve further. And if we go this direction, we can see that the mid-frame contrast is kicking up and up into this corner. We can see that up into the left corner, things are looking better. Down in the right corner, things are also looking better. And you can actually see that this lens obviously does a little bit of dipping up and down. So it's actually... I would say sharper here than what it is here. And so there's just a little bit of ebbs and flows in terms of resolution, but at more typical magnification levels, everything looks really, really great. Now, if we stop down onto F5.6, you can see now that we're getting a much more consistent sharpness profile. And so the, all the way to the extreme corner looks great. Here in this zone, obviously looks a whole lot better. If we pan up this direction, we can see that it's looking better throughout this zone as well. And if we look on the other side, where it's a little bit sharper, we can see it looks fantastic there. And it looks really, really fantastic here towards this left side. I would say we achieve pretty much our peak performance at f8, which is here on the right. After that point, diffraction will start to become an issue, but at f8, everything is looking really, really great. You can see from f8 to f11 that diffraction is starting to soften the image a bit, and we can go all the way to f22, but you can see by f22 how much of the contrast has been lost, so I would recommend avoiding that. So as discussed in our intro, we do know that the overall minimum focus distance and maximum magnification has been improved, but it's still not great. Now we can see here that the actual performance up close is quite good, but the quality or the quantity of magnification is not particularly high. 
And that means obviously that you're not going to be able to hugely magnify subjects, nor are you going to be able to put backgrounds strongly out of focus. It does still allow for some interesting images. Like I still like this image here of my sunglasses because there is still some environment there to tell the story. But obviously at the same time, it's not going to be strongly blurred out in the background. We've looked at this image already. And actually I do still like this image, but again, it's not because the background is strongly blurred out. Now, when it comes to the color rendition, this optical glass isn't the world's top. There's a little bit of a look to the rendering. In some situations, it works. Now, this is maybe a little bit intense for my taste, but in here, even though there's probably a very slight yellow green cast to the the optics it really works for an image like this and then in other situations i felt like the colors looked really quite beautiful however here's another example here where i feel like they just turn almost a little cartoonish not quite as accurate as what i would like you can also see that contrast uh, as far as the shadows sometimes shadows feel a little bit lifted with this lens it's a look and i don't mind the look in many situations but it's not always perfect Another area where the lens I thought did quite good is when it comes to a budget astro lens. And so you can see in the center of the, the lens, the fact or the frame, the fact that this lens is very sharp means that you can get lots of uh, star points on there and they're nice and crisp. Off towards the edge of the frame, you can see, yes, there's a little bit of coma that is there, but it's not strongly pronounced. And of course, the reality that this lens has such a wide focal length means that you're going to get some really dynamic um, astro type shots uh, really for a very very tight budget there now flare resistance is the final area that we'll look at and it's an area where there's certainly some vulnerabilities now per gear claims that this lens has been improved i'm sure that that's true but it's far from perfect we can see in this shot that while the sunburst effect looks good you can see that there is some pretty strong ghosting here on the left side of the image in this shot here i've been able to eliminate a bit of that by uh, just kind of framing the sun in such a way. But I did note when I was panning up and down that there was a certain point where I got this flash of flare light coming through. So I got a photo of that here. So you really have to be careful with your composition because in certain positions, you're going to get, you know, this, and you can see the ghosting artifact here. So you have to be careful in how you compose, but it is avoidable in some situations, but flare resistance is still an area of vulnerability for the lens. So clearly there are quite a few strengths for this lens despite its inexpensive price tag. There's some weaknesses as well, for sure. And it's not, I would say, a flawless lens. It's not, I would even say, the most accurate lens in terms of the color rendering, but there's something about the images that are quite charming in many situations. At the same time, I think that this lens has a tremendous price to performance ratio. It is really, really surprisingly sharp, even on a very high resolution body. So I was really impressed by the detail that were in the images and particularly impressed how that detail extended right into the corners. The first 14 millimeter lens I used was the Samyang slash Rokinon 14 millimeter F 2.8 manual focus lens. And I used that lens a good 10 plus years ago. And while it had good performance in the center of the frame, the corners were really quite soft. And so I'm really impressed by this lens, which is smaller, less expensive, all of those things. And it manages to extend that sharpness right off to the edges of the frame. So very, very impressive there. And here's where I think this lens is interesting. 14 millimeters is too extreme a focal length for most people for it to be their primary lens, or even maybe the lens that they use the most. And so the less that a lens gets used, you know, maybe the less likely most people are to spend a large amount of money on that lens, a lens that they might use maybe only 20% of the time instead of 50% or more. And that makes a lens like the Pergear 14mm f2.8 Mark II an intriguing option because at just $300, it's not a huge investment, which means that for many people, they might be able to add this lens to their kit and get the very dynamic extreme images that such a wide angle of view provides but without dumping a lot of cash on it. And what I personally find the consolation in that kind of scenario is, is that even if I'm not reaching for the lens all the time, I don't feel like I have wasted a large chunk of money that's just sitting on the shelf most of the time. 
And so as a byproduct, I think that this could be an interesting addition to a lot of people's kits. I'm Dustin Abbott, and if you look in the description down below, you can find linkage to my, uh, my full text review or to the image gallery. There is a discount code there that can help you to get the lens a little bit cheaper than the quoted MSRP. And beyond that, there's links to follow myself on social media, to get channel merchandise, to become a patron. Please like and subscribe if you haven't already. Thanks for watching. Have a great day, and let the light in.